With this, you can continue voting or letting us know from where you're tuned in. And I will now start with the official announcement. So kicking off this Agora online event by welcoming you, dear audience. My name is Nicola Bock. I am the head of events at Agora Energiewende. And today's topic is the EU's Fit for 55 package, which the Commission will propose in July. Yesterday, they, de they decided to propose in July and not in June. So on the website, it still says June on our website. But apparently, we can expect the package for July now. We at Agora have defined 10 benchmarks to make this package a success. And this is what we're going to make you familiar with today, or we would like to present this to you today. The agenda of today's event is quite simple. We have an hour and a half, and we will give you a presentation which will last some 30 to 40 minutes, and then we should have ample time, around about half an hour, for your questions in our Q&A session. Um, and I'd now like to introduce you to the panel, so let me stop sharing the slides. So we have all the space for my colleagues who will be joining now. For the presentation, we, I'd like to introduce you to Andreas Graf, who is Project Manager, EU Energy Policy at Agora Energiewende. Welcome, Andreas. And we also have Matthias Buck, who's head of the EU Energy Policy at Agora Energiewende. Those two are actually responsible for what you're going to see for those 10 benchmarks. Welcome, Matthias. We also have a few colleagues supporting us. Um, there is Max Maxi Matsanke, who will take care of the chat during the event. Hello, hello, Maxi. She works in the events department of Agora Energiewende. And we also have Claire Stamm, who's senior communication manager at Agora's communication department, responsible mainly for EU communication topics. Welcome, Claire. And she'll be looking after the Q&As um, towards the end of the event. But before we go into the content part, I would like to make you familiar with the Zoom room we are hosting this event in. Some of you may already know it because I keep repeating everything I'm going to say in the next five minutes, but I think it's still good to know, um, especially if it's the first event you're joining and also to fresh up if you have joined in the past. So at the bottom of your screen, you see two different buttons. One is chat and one is the Q&A button. We ask you to use the chat button primarily only for your technical and organizational questions. And Maxi will be looking after them and will try to make, make, uh, give you answers and find solutions for whatever questions and remarks you have. These will remain invisible throughout the entire event. As opposed to the Q&A section, this one is supposed for your content-related questions. So anything that comes up during the presentation, you can put it there, and Claire will have an eye on that, and pick the ones um, for the Q&A session at the end of the event. These will also remain invisible until we pick them, and then we will most probably put them on, on make them visible. So in case you're typing very quickly, make sure um, there are no careless mistakes. And um, if you have a specific question to either Andreas or Matthias, you can um, put that into, into the um, remark as well, so that it's a bit easier to, to make sure who it goes to. Um, we are recording this event in order to make it available afterwards. So don't be surprised. And if you're curious to see how many people are actually joining apart from you, on the top left where the little Zoom button is or the little Zoom icon, you can see how many people are on the podium and how many are in the audience. At the moment, we're looking at 156. And as I said, I have a little control monitor here to the left to see what you see and make sure that everything is running well. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Andreas and Matthias. The floor is yours. Enjoy. Thank you, Nicola. And uh, welcome to all of you participating in today's webinar. <clears throat> we will try to cover a very broad round. Um, so fasten your seatbelts and open your minds. Uh, we are doing this 
based from Berlin and Brussels, so also representing the different locations of Agora in Europe. Um, let's go ahead. So the report that we have developed over the past weeks is called is setting 10, 10 benchmarks for success. What is the background? <clears throat> um, on the 21st of April, the Parliament, Commission, and um, member states reached a political compromise on the EU climate law. We expect the compromise to become legally binding after confirmation by the institutions in a few weeks' time. This um, European climate law sets a long-term binding objective um, of climate neutrality by latest 2050, but it also um, puts in place a legally binding 2030 climate target of at least 55% net domestic greenhouse gas reductions compared to 1990 level, a, very, a significant increase um, to the current target of minus 40%. Importantly, this is a domestic target, so it's not um, delivered through international mechanisms trading with outside countries outside the EU, and it refers to net greenhouse gas reductions, i.e. Um, emissions after deduction of removals. As part of the compromise reached, um, it was agreed that the contrib contribution of removals towards the target would be limited to 225 million tons uh, CO2 equivalents, uh, which means that um, we are actually dealing with a 52.8% reduction relative to 1990 levels, excluding six. Now, at the same time, the Commission made a declaration to the minutes, um, you can actually find it in the compromise agreement, that it will propose a revision to the LULUCF regulation to increase the EU carbon sink to levels above 300 million tons CO2 equivalents. Uh, so we are expecting a net target of around 57% for 2030. Next slide, please, Andreas. Yes, so this target, of course, means very uh, significant changes across all sectors. And with this image, we've tried to summarize some of those changes, both in terms of the emissions reductions that could be seen in different sectors, as well as concrete benchmark uh, technolo technology and energy developments that we could also see. So um, the the waterfall graphic for each um, sector shows the expected emissions reductions in um, a mixed scenario of the Commission impact assessment for its 2030 target plan. And what this shows is that a very significant share of the emissions foreseen in this impact assessment are expected to occur in the current EU ETS sectors, uh, in particular the power sector and energy industry, but also uh, industry itself. Nonetheless, significant emissions reductions are also expected in the non-ETS sector, so-called, so uh, covered by the Climate Action Regulation. So buildings, transport, as well as other non-CO2 and CO2 emissions. Lastly, um, with the new commitment of the Commission in writing to propose a removals target that is significantly above what could be foreseen under a business as usual circumstance, we should also expect removals to make a contribution and um, potentially have an additional commitment on agriculture. So what does this mean in practice? This means, uh, and I will just highlight a few of examples, a complete, nearly complete coal phase out by 2030, uh, and uh, the need for a, a massive upscaling of renewables in the power mix, a switch of te technologies in the, in the industry uh, sector, uh, especially, for example, in steel to direct reduction of iron for primary steel production, as well as a upscaling of, of clean hydrogen for the time even um, up to 2030, but especially thereafter. In the building sector, a significant improvement of the renovation rate and depth 
as well as a acceleration of uptake of clean technologies. In transport, um, perhaps the headline figure is the need for 50 to 70 million EVs to be on the roads uh, of, of the EU uh, by 2030, um, but also the need for greater electrification. Um, and maybe to, to, to finish with agriculture and LULUCF, um, an increased target should um, push removals to beyond uh, current levels. And um, we could use this momentum to put the overall agriculture and LULUCF sectors on a pathway to, towards climate neutrality by 2035. So such an acceleration in climate action in Europe in the next few years until 2030 will require a comprehensive update of our climate and energy laws. The Commission has uh, in its work program for the July package nine legal proposals to reform um, the legislation. We have listed them here. We will mention them in our presentation in more detail. There are also some uh, complementary proposals on aviation fuel and maritime fuel, as well as on own resources. In the EU uh, jargon, this means the system of the EU to uh, make an income. So how it uh, gets its finances. And some of these resources are so-called own resources. And um, this is also complementary because some of these resources link to the new instruments. Next slide, please, Andreas. So the new publication that you can download from our website, um, you see here, what do we try to do? Our aim is to help all those involved seeing the forest for the trees, as we say in German, because it's going to be a huge package. Um, we have a very short description of the sectoral transition pathways up to 2030 to deliver 55%. We do have some guiding principles that we believe should underpin the package as a whole. Then we go into quite some detail um, to uh, the legislation that will that is in the July package. We also look ahead to the Q4 package because uh, the July package is not everything, but there will be additional measures to come, and we are highlighting some that currently seem to be missing. Next slide, please, Andreas. So how do we go about it? If you open the report, you see that for each of the benchmarks areas, we go three steps. We check where do we stand today. Then we have a, a box on where do we need to be in 2030 in this specific area um, to deliver the 55%. And then the bottom box, what we need to do on each benchmark is describing the measures that are necessary in updating the le legislation to successfully reduce emissions by 2030. Andreas, next slide, please. So we are, of course, not doing this out of thin air, but we are building on a broad range of reports done by uh, Agora, uh, also um, referring, of course, to some of the research done uh, by other partners in the network. Um, we're listing here only some of the studies that are underpinning this particular report, where you see, can find much more detail on some of the um, messages in this very condensed publication that we are presenting to you today. Next slide, please. So now now we, we would, yeah. thank you, Matthias. Now we would like to go to uh, the part where we introduce the 10 benchmarks highlighted in the report. And before starting, I would just like to highlight that, of course, we cannot go through each of these boxes in full depth. So we will be trying to summarize the boxes with their head headlines, but also go through some of the key points that are uh, specifically related to what we think needs to be done um, in the uh, upcoming July package. So the first set of measures or benchmarks uh, that we have identified um, are related to the need for enhanced carbon pricing and the need for this to be done with fairness and environmental integrity. And we have identified four benchmarks in this area. The first is the need to strengthen emissions trading to phase out coal. 
and accelerate the transition to climate neutral industry. Now, in the last uh, months or somewhat over a year now, the COVID-19 crisis, um, as well as the previous financial crisis, have led to historic surplus and reduced economic activity over, over, uh, over a period. And the ETS cap must now be tightened to reflect this as well as the climate target that we have just agreed. Um, several studies, including a recent one um, by Ogunsud and, and WWF, goes through many, many different scenarios highlighting the impact of, of the crisis um, on the potential surplus in the market and comes out with concrete figures as to what reforms would be needed to uh, meet the minus 65% emissions reductions foreseen in the commission's impact assessment with the certainty that this will happen. Um, and fundamentally, there are two options or two basic reforms that have to occur. The first is the setting of a more ambitious linear reduction factor in the ETS, so the sharpening of the cap year by year. But the second, to reflect the uh, surplus um, and the reduced economic activity, is the, a reform of um, the MSR. And there are a number of different uh, very technical details that have to be could be reformed here. Fundamentally, um, there are two ways one could do it. One can um, choose to have a lower linear reduction factor, reducing the cap yearly, and um, change multiple factors in the MSR reform. Or one can have a higher linear reduction factor and a and roughly keep the um, the MSR in its current state, uh, maintaining the current intake rate at 24%. Uh, now, another option um, beyond the linear reduction factor to reform the cap is to do a one-off rebasing. Uh, if this would be done in, for example, 2023, one could re reduce the linear reduction factor um, slightly. Now, uh, a second key set of reforms is related to free allocation for industry. Um, Matthias will touch on this in benchmark three. Um, and um, so I will conclude just by pointing out that uh, in the expansion of the EU ETS um, to shipping um, and reform uh, of uh, extra EU uh, aviation emissions, it will be very important to avoid attempts to move aviation emissions currently from the ETS into Corsia and, and leave those um, not sufficiently regulated. And at the same time, the ETS revenues that are increasingly being generated at very high levels um, should be put to very good use given the significant investments that are needed. The second benchmark is the need to also reflect higher ambition in the climate action regulation and um, also enhance carbon pricing in key sectors in this regulation, transport and buildings. And for this, we believe a new separate ETS is needed. Now, reflecting some of the adjustments that we will touch on in benchmark 10 relating to a, the need for a new self-standing pillar for agriculture, forestry, and land use, the climate action regulation would likely need to be adjusted to reflect that non-CO2 emissions for agriculture are moved into a new sector. This will, of course, require beyond some of the suggested emissions reductions for the climate action regulation, also higher emissions reductions in relative terms uh, for transport and buildings. And we have calculated this, that this would require an overall uh, reduction with, when non-CO2 emissions for agriculture are not considered of minus 44% relative to 2005 levels. Now, to reflect this ambition for an EU target, we will also need national level targets. And these will need to be agreed upon by member states and will need to reflect both the higher ambition as well as the need to take into uh, account different circumstances, especially um, different wealth levels within the EU. So finally, we 
propose that a new separate ETS uh, is introduced starting in 2025, and we propose concrete details in the publication as to what this could look like. Shortly, um, what a rough estimate of some of the key figures could be that the overall cap could decline roughly in line with the overall EU emission reduction in the climate action regulation. And we believe that uh, a portion of the revenues generated um, should be distributed also to lower income member states to reflect the different burden that they faced. So um, next benchmark, we called an effective and cooperative approach to carbon leakage protection for European industries in their transition to climate neutrality. Now the background to this, of course, is that we are expecting a significantly higher carbon prices in the emissions trading system uh, already in the short term. And uh, those following carbon price uh, developments have seen that we're almost at 50 euros per ton um, of carbon emissions um, at the moment. Now, this is creating a short term um, carbon leakage challenge for the existing European industry. Um, but the strengthening of the ETS system and the reduction of the allowances under the system also create a long term transition challenge because, simply put, the number of allowances um, that would be given as free allocation to industry at one point, um, sometimes between 2030 and 2040, would be a um, larger number than the number of allowances under the system as such. So we need to move to a different type of um, carbon uh, leakage system in the long term. Um, at the same time, of course, um, there is the need to also in the next few years start scaling the green technologies that European industry needs to move to climate neutrality. And at this point, most of these technologies come with a significantly higher cost um, for producing the same product. Um, so there are a number of challenges that need to um, be addressed. One of the solutions that is entertained in Europe to deal with this challenge is a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, the important message um, we give on the CBAM, as it's uh, the acronym, is that we do not need a, the long-term anti-leakage system until after 2030. So we still have some time. We ca still can um, build the system so it is um, fully operational and effective. And it also um, picks up some of the concerns of our international partners. Um, to have a functional um, carbon border adjustment mechanism in place, um, we will need in Europe data on embedded emissions and basic materials and intermediate products. We will also need such data for any green um, product standards. So working on improving the availability, quality and comparability of such data is really a no regret um, urgent issue. Then our, our recommendation is that a CBAM should initially start with cement and lowly traded products, so to have a lower risk of resource shuffling or shifting imports to downstream products. We feel it's quite important that uh, the EU throughout developing its um, carbon leakage protection system further developing it um, for its industry, it must engage with its main trading partners to explain why effective carbon leakage protection is necessary for the EU's industrial transition, how the CBAM would work, and how some of its potentially undesirable impacts on developing country exports could be mitigated, and how it could interact with other approaches to carbon leakage protection that some other countries are entertaining at this point. At the same time, to ensure WTO compatibility, it must be very clear throughout that the CBAM in Europe is helping Europe to um, support its industry move to 
climate neutrality and not an instrument imposing our own approach to this transition on our international partners under the Paris Agreement. As a sign of um, a cooperative approach to a CBAM, we would propose that at least part of the revenues are used directly to support climate change mitigation and adaptation activities in developing countries. And um, while we are waiting for the CBAM to phase in, which, as I said, would only be necessary really after 2030, um, some further reforms to free all allocation under the emissions trading system are necessary to cope with the increase in prices um, in the short run. The key priorities we see here are um, temporary output, output based free allocation, as well as to ensure that the new green technologies that also need support to be phased in and scaled up rapidly receive the same free allocation as conventional high carbon ones to avoid distortions. Andreas? Yes, and finally, in this group of benchmarks, um, there is the Energy Taxation Directive, which will also be revised uh, in this coming package. And here it is quite important that some of the weaknesses of the existing Energy Taxation Directive are corrected, but also that with the new separate emissions trading system, the interaction between existing energy taxes and the new system which affects energy tax or, or pricing um, are addressed. So um, very clearly one of the main priorities is to um, find a way to deal with this interaction. Um, currently, there are many countries that have very low energy taxation on some heating fuels. Uh, most member states have high energy taxation in transport. Um, the introduction of uh, an emissions trading system um, could lead some member states to want to replace current existing energy taxation um, with the new carbon pricing uh, when it is introduced. Um, and it is very important that the, um, the understanding that is reached uh, in the Energy Taxation Directive um, under no circumstances permits uh, or, 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 or that it deals with um, the potential risk of lower climate ambition that this could cause for some member states. Um, secondly, um, the existing uh, energy taxation directive um, has very uh, lead, allows for very limited taxation for some fuels or a distorted taxation for some transported transport fuels. This is most um, in particular for kerosene, where um, kerosene is largely untaxed at this point in time, also due to some international legal commitments of the past. And uh, diesel taxation is often still at a lower level relative to petrol. Finally, um, there is still the existing issue that um, with all taxes, levies, and surcharges, especially in some member states, electricity is significantly um, more expensive in relative terms than um, some fossil fuel competitors. And there is the need for all member states to um, take measures to address these um, this uh, unbalanced uh, situation, as well as remove barriers to electrification. And we believe that um, roadmap a roadmap for member states should be discussed in the context of the Energy Taxation Directive. Now, sectoral policies. <clears throat> Andreas mentioned it, uh, I believe, in passing, that um, in addition to strengthening carbon pricing in the ETS as a tool to reduce emissions, but also um, in transport and buildings, we consider that we do need strong sectoral policies in the sectors as companions to increased carbon pricing. And uh, we can go um, through some of the arguments why this is really important um, perhaps in the discussion. Now the first sector policy, um, next slide please Andreas, um, the benchmark five uh, looks at the renewable energy directive. Um, we all know renewable 
energy and this rapid scaling of up of renewables is at the heart of the energy transition, particularly in the power sector. And um, so it goes without saying that uh, the increase in the EU climate target also requires a corresponding increase in the EU's binding target on renewable energy that should be increased to at least 38%. There are some consequential, consequential changes necessary in the governance regulation to follow through on member states planning for delivering this higher share of renewables. Um, we also believe it is necessary to revise Article 23 of the Renewable Energy Directive. Why? Because renewable heating and cooling is a very important um, tool to reduce emissions, particularly in buildings. And at the moment, the renewable heating and cooling target in Article 23 is very weak. Um, so we need to strengthen this target and we need to add measures that provide a level playing field for electricity and thermal renewables alongside renewable fuels. Article 19, in our view, also needs to be strengthened. There's a lot of appetite um, by the private sector in particular to move very rapidly to invest into um, renewable electricity or renewable energies. Uh, we consider that the current guarantees of origin system in the Renewable Energy Directive should be strengthened to enable this market-driven investments and green public procurement. And we're proposing that the EU should introduce in that context an additionality label for new and unsupported capacity, counting private investments separately from the member state targets and the measures they take to deliver those targets. The last point is on bioenergy. All the studies show that the sustainable energy, pardon, the sustainable bioenergy potential until 2050 is limited, and uh, that the bioenergy uses that we uh, need need to be prioritized on where it is really necessary. Um, so to help um, come to say a better use, a smarter use of bioenergy in the next decade in view of 2050, we believe that the EU should introduce a requirement for member states to first map their sustainable energy, bioenergy potential until 2050. Do this as part of the update of the national energy and climate plans that is due by June 30th in 2024. But in parallel, given the restrictions that we know, the Commission should already propose now a binding legal framework to cap the use of primary forest biomass and biomass in the power and heat sectors and phase out support for first generation bioenergy by no later than 2030. Next slide. On the end use side, uh, the target also implies that all member states will have to significantly increase end use savings across all sectors, um, and in particular, accelerate the decarbonization of buildings. This will also require a protection of tenants in the context of higher carbon pricing, as well as increased renovations. So on the target side and the ambition side, um, the higher ambition should be reflected in higher energy efficiency targets at EU and national level. And when it comes to the commitment of governments to building renovation, we also see the need for governments to take a much stronger lead by example. Currently, only uh, some central government uh, buildings are um, covered by a current target for government building renovations. We believe that this target should be expanded to all public buildings and that the standard by which they should be renovated should be increased to near zero energy building standards. At the same time, with increased um, CO2 pricing via a new separate emissions trading system, it will also be important for governments to lead by example in their own interest um, by 
uh, using CO2 price projections for the new system in their purchasing decisions, especially with regards to the management of their public sector vehicle fleets and buildings. Other instruments in the Energy Efficiency Directive should be also be strengthened. This uh, includes energy efficiency obligations under Article 7, uh, which um, could be increased or should be increased to at least 1.6% per year starting in 2025. And in this context, one could also strengthen, on the one hand, the social obligations linked to these um, energy efficiency obligations, as well as um, one could remove some of the um, unnecessary uh, malices for renovation measures um, and uh, increase the accounting for this framework. Now, in terms of tenant protection, um, we have recently published uh, the English version of a study that describes how uh, Sweden has addressed um, some of the social justice concerns in its building sector, having reduced its uh, emissions in the building sector by some 95%. Um, and what they um, use as one instrument is all-inclusive temperature-based rents. I would direct you to our recent study on this. Um, in the ED, uh, it is important that the Article 9 um, on individual metering is reformed in such a way that uh, all member states can make use of such an instrument. On the support uh, of, of heat planning, um, in in particular to make maximum use of uh, the district he heating potential in uh, more densely populated areas. We also believe that Article 14 should be strengthened um, to introduce an obligation for all municipalities larger than 20,000 inhabitants to produce and regularly update uh, plans for how they uh, plan to achieve climate neutrality by no later than 2050. This is a model that uh, has been uh, pursued successfully in many Nordic countries in the past and is now uh, being pursued by the region Baden-Württemberg in Germany, uh, where they also support all municipalities in this transition. Anything else? Are you switching the slide? Uh, I have. Benchmark Sorry. 7 is up on my screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the next one, next focus benchmark seven is on industry and hy renewable hydrogen. The background to this is that uh, there is a very strong uh, dynamic to scale up hydrogen use and um, preferably renewable hydrogen uh, in industry because it is necessary to enable um, moving to climate neutral technologies. The demand is very significant. The hydrogen strategy of the Commission is pushing very much into the right direction, but still given the limitations to produce renewable hydrogen, because it does require renewable electricity, um, it needs to be prioritized. So the basic and most important message on this cluster of um, industry uses and renewable hydrogen development and uses is efficiency first. So use um, renewable hydrogen for the applications where it is really needed and um, to um, use other um, pathways, particularly direct ele electrification wherever it is um, available. And uh, this is also makes most sense actually from a cost perspective. Now, going to um, Article 8 of the ED, we believe should be strengthened so that um, the recommendations from energy audits, audits are taken more seriously. So those um, with coming with a payback time of less than three to four, five years are made mandatory. As I said, the energy efficiency first principle must be enshrined in all hydrogen related legislative initiatives and this sits across a number of instruments under development um, to prioritize direct electrification wherever this is technically possible. 
the Renewable Energy Directive should establish a robust sustainability framework for hydrogen to ensure the additionality of the renewable electricity used for green hydrogen production, as well as to have a temporal and geographic correlation of renewable electricity used for green hydrogen production. Specifically, when it comes to industry uses of uh, renewable energy, it is important to establish a no regrets hierarchy based on the efficiency first principle. So the more energy efficient renewable energy solutions should be used whenever technically feasible so that scarce resources such as biomass and green hydrogen are used optimally. This goes particularly for low and medium temperature heat applications where direct electrification could go a very long way in reducing industry emissions. From that perspective, the revised RED should oblige the member states to develop enabling measures for the switching to renewable and clean power in industry, especially when it comes to low and medium temperature heating. And when it comes to um, the scaling of renewable hydrogen production, and its use, it is important that the EU establishes a robust policy, regulatory and investment framework for scaling the production and for developing a no regret infrastructure for green hydrogen. We have recently published a report specifically on no regret infrastructure investments that could be entertained in the next years. And uh, we will, um, over the coming months, um, also publish um, something more specific on the regulatory and investment framework for green hydrogen. Next slide, Andreas, please. Now, some of the major changes under the Climate Action Regulation and with the introduction of a new separate emissions trading system, we will also need to accompany these changes with stronger EU-level measures for transport, um, both to make a robust contribution to the national targets, as well as to um, reduce the impact of CO2 pricing on households and businesses where possible by making reductions um, and big steps towards electrification. We also know that if we want to achieve climate neutrality, um, transport will need to be climate neutral by 2050 and that uh, with the average lifetimes of, of cars and vans, we will need to have um, new fossil combustion engines no longer entering the market by the latest 2035. The EU level instrument and the natural instrument for a coordinated contribution towards an EU level target of net 55% is CO2 limit values in the CO2 emissions performance standards. And these will be um, increased in the proposed July package. We believe that they should be uh, increased and tightened to up to 75%. That is relative to the current target of 37.5% below the fleet average in 2021. We believe that there will also be the need to have a robust 2025 interim target and a more continuous evaluation. And this is also for the reasons we saw last year in the compliance with the previous uh, targets for 2020, where um, we had a massive acceleration of EV uptake very close to the end of the, the target period. Um, we don't need um, 50 to 70 million uh, cars coming on the roads in 2029 and 2030. We need them coming on the roads throughout the entire decade. Now, um, in that context, um, it, it will also be important to make sure that there is um, environmental integrity in the CO2 two limits. In the past, there have been many efforts by industry to introduce different loopholes and different uh, provisions that um, in essence undermine the strictness of the limits. Um, we have named some here that are uh, should be 
in particular taken into account. And finally, uh, looking towards the period, especially after 2030, we do need to also begin the transition to a regulatory framework that not only regulates the CO2 per emissions performance of combustion cars, but also takes into account the energy efficiency performance of electric vehicles, which will be the dominant um, vehicle type in the period after 2030. Now, to have 50 to 70 million cars on the road in 2030 also means rolling out the infrastructure for zero emissions vehicles. Um, in the coming years, we will also see uh, a sharpening of uh, CO2 per emissions performance standards for heavy duty vehicles. Um, and heavy duty vehicles will also need to make an important contribution uh, to the target and um, um, for cars and vans, on the one hand, uh, the picture is relatively clear, um, that, uh, but planning is greater planning and the obligation to accelerate the deployment of the necessary charging infrastructure is needed. And um, so we suggest that there is a more continuous and a more differentiated approach uh, to planning for the necessary infrastructure um, and that an obligation is introduced for member states to um, expand their charging infrastructure in line with such a needs assessment. And of course, we believe that poor member states should be supported in, that, in those efforts um, by a, a differentiated support under the 10T funds that exist today. For heavy duty transport, the infrastructure picture is not uh, fully resolved. Um, in, it includes um, potentially, uh, for example, for electric uh, charging overhead catenary lines for important priority corridors, as well as uh, very significant uh, charging infrastructure for much larger vehicles or um, um, uptake of clean hydrogen uh, for long distance transport. Um, in the coming years, we will need to have greater clarity about which infrastructure will be needed for heavy duty uh, transport to make its uh, contribution towards the 2030 target. And therefore we uh, believe that th this decision point needs to be prepared by 2025 through the support of um, pilot projects essentially in key priority corridors and to use that, those lessons learned to make uh, a similar uh, needs assessment and um, obligation for member states um, after this decision point has happened in 2025. And finally, the current framework of the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive still includes support for natural gas and liquefied petroleum gas, fossil gas uh, infrastructure. We believe that uh, it, it is only consistent with the climate neutrality objective to remove these from the scope of the directive. Finally, but very importantly, um, the issue of land use, uh, forestry and agriculture, um, something that was uh, referenced at the very beginning of this presentation, um, the climate law trilog negotiation outcome um, suggests that the commission will propose a significant removals target. Um, at the same time, um, we have seen that agriculture and non-CO2 emissions over the last uh, decade and, and, and beyond have flatlined and have not increased or decreased, sorry, um, at the rate that would be needed. Um, we do anticipate that non-CO2 emissions from agriculture will still be significant um, in 2050. They are among, it is a sector with among the most difficult uh, emissions to reduce. Nonetheless, um, much more is possible and will need to happen. And um, also the commission scenarios uh, suggest that more is possible um, than, than um, also member state uh, projections currently anticipate. So we believe that um, the most important uh, step in, in driving both removals and uh, agricultural emissions reductions will be to create a new AFLU regulation with its own governance structure um, to um, drive, monitor, govern emissions reductions in these sections, uh, sectors. This 
framework should reflect the agreement uh, about the maximum contribution of net removals towards the climate target in the other regulations, meaning the emissions trading system and the climate action regulation should be ambitious enough that um, uh, removals um, in the AFALU regulation are additional to those emissions reductions. Um, and in the new AFALU regulation, uh, we will need to set clear targets for both removals and agricultural uh, non-CO2 emissions in the form of a climate neutrality objective, but also each member state should be required to uh, report and govern on emissions in every one of the subsectors that of the AFALU regulation. We also believe that uh, to maintain environmental integrity, there will need to be a strict firewall in other terms, meaning a strict limiting of flexibility between the originator uh, instrument, the climate, accurate, uh, climate action regulation, and the new AFALU regulation. Um, and finally, um, when it comes to uh, land use, land use change, and forestry monitoring, reporting, and verifications, we will need to uh, improve uh, rules, um, but also uh, monitoring tools. Um, sa certain satellite technologies are coming um, or, or uh, can be better used in the coming decade to ensure that also issues related to non permanence and volatility in light of growing national disturbances with climate change are taken greater into account um, because, of course, the reporting and verification should uh, be robust to what we are actually seeing on the ground, not only in paperwork. So, and if you think this is already a lot, what you're seeing here in this picture, then um, the good news is you will need to get used to it because more is to come. Um, there is a second part already envisaged of this Fit for 55 package in the Commission Work Program. Andreas, if you can highlight it. So um, already explicitly in the work program is the gas package and methane regulations. And uh, the EPBD, which is the terrible acronym, uh, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. And um, in our analysis, and we described this in the report uh, quite briefly, but still very importantly, some parts are missing. And this um, above all refers to what we call the clean industry for your package. Um, the European industry must start the transition to climate neutrality within this decade. And for this uh, industry needs a robust investment framework and business case. And uh, so th there are a number of elements and we have addressed them in multiple reports uh, that you can find on our webpage over the past year. Um, they still need to be articulated in the work program where exactly this comes in, particularly when it comes to state aid, uh, when it comes to creating lead markets for climate neutral products and um, how to strengthen circular economy, the circular economy um, through which measures and targets so to ensure that there's much higher material efficiency in um, the industrial ecosystem. I already mentioned in passing the governance regulation, so the energy union governance regulation, so let's say the framework um, governance of energy and climate laws in Europe also needs to be updated because member states are obliged to prepare um, updates to their national energy and climate plans starting in 2023 with the updates. And of course, it is imperative that those updates are fully consistent with Europe's higher ambition on climate in a 2030 perspective, which currently wouldn't be guaranteed. Then there are some other elements coming into the picture like hydrogen, um, green hydrogen, how to plan for the scaling of green hydrogen, um, the industry, a decarbonization, which also was not an issue when the governance regulation was negotiated at the time, etc., and as well the interface to climate finance. So there are a number of points that still need to be articulated, which are missing. Still, um, we have already covered a lot in the 14 July package, and um, I believe, Andres, this was our last slide. 
no? But there's more to come. So. Yes. Let me take over back from you. Thank you very much for this um, I would say heavy presentation. Um, at least the this, this slides looked very heavy to me, a bit like slides. Uh, sometimes lawyers uh, tend to um, sort of uh, create them. Um, I can already see there are a few questions in the Q&A box, but maybe because of the heavy stuff and the amount of information our audience got, some are still making up their mind of, what to post so we you can you're still invited to add your questions and remarks into the Q&A box and we now have around about half an hour um, for exactly this and I would now like to ask Claire to step onto the podium she's been watching the Q&A section and um, I'm sure she's already picked a few of them to be shared now with the rest of the audience. So over to you, Claire. Yes, thank you, Nicola, and uh, welcome to everyone from my side to this uh, Q&A session. And uh, indeed, uh, there are quite a uh, few questions coming, uh, coming in already. Uh, I will start with a, a definition question that uh, you used at the beginning of your presentation. And this comes from uh, Heinz Otto Peitgen. Please define removals the term you, you used at the beginning of your presentation. So um, the definition of removals uh, that I could make is probably less relevant than what the EU climate law uh, agreement uh, makes. Um, if, if I remember correctly, they'd, they might uh, specifically refer to carbon removals, but I would have to look again at this test. I'm, I'm happy to follow up. But it, yes, um, the, the removals um, definition it refers uh, um, to the uh, removals definition in the climate law. Uh, and um, of course, when it comes to AFALU, it is mainly referring to natural removals, um, but uh, there are also technical sinks with the CCS um, that that uh, are likely to be factored into the overall target. Right. Um, then I'll carry on on the success of the package. A question from Tomas Novak. Success of the package depends on market uptake. So how much of this can be the result of regulation and how much should, must be the result of a change energy price system, for example, by introducing a significant CO2 price for heating in buildings and industry transport? Um, I would say we need both. So I, I wouldn't um, throw out, um, Thomas, a direct number on either one, um, but we need both in combination. We need a robust um, and visible um, increase in the price of carbon emissions also in um, transport and buildings. This will automatically uh, make a better business case for some of the um, clean energy investments necessary in that sector. But um, we, of course, also know that the price sensitivity, particularly when it comes to buildings and transport, is not as sensitive as in the sectors currently under the emissions trading system. So we will need additional regulation and other measures, for instance, financial uh, investment support um, for housing renovation in addition to the carbon price. So it's a mix. We need both. Right. Then uh, a question on uh, the benchmark number four on energy taxes and uh, a clarification question um, just to make just to just to understand it when referring to clear indicative political target for reducing the price ratio between electricity and gas retail, retail prices are you referring to a political 
artificial price intervention to favor electrification and thus beyond technology neutral principles? Um, well, one could th turn that question around and say it's a political invent intervention to not be taxing gas at the same level as electricity. That is a choice. Um, so we are reversing that choice. Um, that being said, we currently have very different landscape in Europe. Um, and the principle of CO2 pricing for these sectors is a new one. So of course, this is a transition that will have to be managed and will not happen overnight. Uh, though in Germany, um, the discussions are accelerating quite rapidly because this um, unlevel playing field for gas to, uh, you know, in favor of gas um, over electricity has been maintained for so long and at the cost of climate as well as our energy targets. So uh, now we're in a situation where in Germany, um, there are discussions about uh, using the new um, revenues from emissions trading to reduce the costs um, put on electricity uh, um, via a surcharge to help fund the renewable energy um, law um, funded uh, investments. Um, and um, this could be in fact, potentially completely budget financed in future uh, in large part uh, with um, CO2 revenues. So this is maybe at the extreme though, however, because of the large disparity between electricity gas prices in Germany, which are um, four, f where there's a fourfold difference. I believe the average in Europe currently is roughly 3.3-fold, uh, uh, whereas the um, lowest difference between electricity and gas retail prices is roughly two-fold. Uh, and I believe it was uh, the Netherlands that has seen this, in large part also due to um, efforts to um, change um, uh, their energy taxation, and they are taking this quite seriously in their current um, um, discussions around how to change energy prices, uh, taxes, and, uh, and levies. All right. Then uh, the next question is about a re renewable hydrogen and red two. So, on red two and uh, additionality concerning the production and consumption of renewable hydrogen. You mentioned temporal and geographic correlation between renewable electricity and renewable hydrogen. Can you el elaborate in practical terms, what would this mean for those economic operators producing hydrogen for your own consumption? So, uh, should I take this or do you want and no, you uh, add, Matthias? You, you start, I add. Okay, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so um, we have, in the discussion around how to scale up hydrogen production, had a very long um, discussion around the need for very robust sustainability criteria. Why is this? Um, because um, there is an opportunity cost in producing renewable hydrogen. It is the renewable electricity that is not going towards decarbonizing the, the power sector, not going towards decarbonizing the electricity going into EVs and heat pumps. Um, and on the other hand, we also have an electricity mix today that uh, means that hydrogen production in many electricity um, um, mixes in Europe, in many national electricity mixes is more polluting than uh, fossil uh, hydrogen with CCS especially, but even fossil hydrogen without CCS. Now, that is clearly not a situation that uh, is acceptable when moving towards higher climate ambition. So we need a robust sustainability framework that guarantees that the scaling of hydrogen, which is needed, um, is done in a robust way. And of course, the most watertight way would be to have regulations that very clearly define that only renewable electric additional renewable electricity is um, used to generate uh, the renewable hydrogen via electrolyzers, that this is not coming at the expense of um, overall electricity system efficiency and therefore lo localization factors are, are taken into consideration and that there is a correlation where there is a draw on the electricity grid between the, the periods of high electricity, or sorry, renewable electricity production 
um, and and not uh, periods where essentially coal and gas are dominating the system. So the exact proposal will be is one where um, many have put things on the table. It's it's it becomes very technical, but those elements have to be respected. And in the strictest case, you would have a completely islanded uh, production site with only additional renewables not connected to the grid producing hydrogen um, there will need to be some flexibility here of course because we want to make use of some of the surplus electricity that's on the grid but it, it can only happen um, in a robust way with regards to sustainability and maintaining let's say also the acceptance of <laughs> of regulators and the population if that if 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 that uh, if those criteria are respected is there anything you would like to add matthias no okay well, it was very comprehensive. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so there are quite a uh, few questions about mm. the extension of emission trading to buildings and road transport. So why do you consider the extension of emission trading to buildings and road transport necessary? What is, in your opinion, the main argument for this? And why are regulations, in your opinion, not sufficient? Um, will the price of the new separate ETS be sufficient to in incentivize uh, any changes in behavior? Andreas, you worked on this for many months. I did. <laughs> and there is not one reason. There are many reasons why this is necessary. The first, first and foremost, it is higher ambition, both in the 2030 and the 2050 perspective. And I think we have to uh, start by um, realizing that with the emissions reductions that are anticipated in the power and industry sector, we have a very different existing ETS. And we have many of the remaining emissions in, in the climate action regulation sectors. Um, and especially in the long run, the question exists um, whether it is the most efficient uh, way to reduce emissions to um, do everything via regulation. So there is a very clear need for regulation that is undisputed in all of our work. Uh, and yet, when you move to, from a, to a point where you need to be climate neutral in 2050, and you want an efficient acceleration of, of the phase out of different technologies over time, we, we do see a situation where the emissions, uh, relative emissions in ETS and non-ETS sectors are very different in 2030 and will be going towards 2050. Now, what is the role of carbon pricing um, for these new sectors relative to, um, to those in the existing ETS? The existing ETS was in the past in a situation um, and is, uh, continues to be in an in industry where some of the technologies are not uh, mature, but we do have, uh, we've had ma very significant cost reductions, especially for renewable energy technologies. Um, and we have the solutions and the carbon price plays a very important role, both to accelerate tra transition in these sectors in phasing out coal, uh, providing an incentive for uh, reducing uh, gas uh, power consumption and scaling up renewables consumption. Um, and Regulations were very important in bringing down those costs for renewables and putting them in the position where carbon pricing could play this accelerating role. Um, but clearly, th that transition has taken place, and it can play a very dominant role. For the non-ETS sectors of transport and buildings, we are in a different situation where, for, for different reasons, lower elasticity of, of, of consumers, um, um, because um, the much is is uh, many of the emissions reductions are really linked to the um, cost point of investment. Um, we have a different uh, understanding of what carbon pricing plays uh, as a role, and regulations are perhaps the dominant instrument for achieving emissions reductions in these sectors. But first of all, um, we have not had the emissions reductions we need. So to the extent that in future or even today, we need uh, emissions trading as a form of compliance instrument um, to ensure there is an incentive to achieve very ambitious goals, it can play a very important role. Also, um, standards uh, for purchase of, 
um, or uh, of cars or or standards for renovation of buildings do not always uh, or efficiently address the the uh, existing or the emissions in those uh, end uses, uh, especially for those uh, assets already on the market. So. Um, both to reduce the rebound effect that we often see when it comes to efficiency measures, as well as to regulate the fuel use in existing assets, our carbon price can play in a very useful complementary role to other regulations and standards. And, um, and place, last but not least, um, CO2 pricing also generates revenues and lowers the difference into the break-even point for investments, which can very much accelerate the deployment of clean technologies, uh, as well as address um, important um, social justice issues by providing revenues for, for investment. So I'll, I'll break those down just for a second. So why are revenues important? Well, um, you know, regulations um, are, are, are very uh, effective measures, but they are also not necessarily always socially just measures. If you force um, a, a landlord to renovate and you don't have the, the effective regulation to ensure that that doesn't come at the, exp at the expense of households uh, in increased rents, if you, if you do this and, and you um, do not provide money to lower income households to, to, to actually finance those renovations, if you do all these things, it can also be socially unjust and, and uh, lack effectiveness um, even. Um, the carbon pricing, to some extent, helps to address this by uh, providing revenues that one can redistribute to provide a greater social justice in making those, those changes, uh, while still also providing incentives, even today, to make the right choice when investing. So as an example, uh, reducing the break-even point uh, in installing a heat pump versus a gas boiler today, which can both achieve significant emissions reductions, but where, of course, we know that the heat pump is the technology investment that will be needed in the long run if we want to efficiently and cost-effectively achieve uh, climate neutrality and where uh, this could pose uh, quite a, a locked-in locked investment. So there, there, it's, a, it's a complex discussion. Uh, um, and, and so reducing it down to uh, there's one reason the carbon pricing I don't think does it justice. We need a policy mix. It is one of the instruments we need in this sector. But I think there are many important reasons for this discussion, um, especially given the, the, the very increased ambition we have now for these sectors, which, um, which should also be uh, a key reason for why the commission is adopting such a policy. Right. <clears throat> so there's another question regarding the, uh, the agriculture and forestry. So how should the uh, AFLU regulation interact with the common agriculture policy? Um, so I'll, I'll start if you want to add anything, Matthias, but um, the climate agriculture policy currently still makes up roughly 50% of the EU budget. Um, now, the, there are new um, planning instruments that have been introduced, um, strategic planning instruments uh, under the cap that are already driving changes. Um, there are um, um, eco schemes that um, are also going to be more uh, strongly implemented in the coming years. These are all part of uh, such um, a new regulation that um, could set clearer targets uh, and ambitions towards achieving climate neutrality in the overall sectors, both in agriculture-related um, and non-agriculture-related sectors in this regulation. But um, the cap could play a very important role to then help finance some of these um, reductions in, in for, to remove emissions, but also to give incentive, for example, to, um, to invest in removals, to invest in carbon farming, to invest in other ways of contributing to the target. And there are very vivid discussions um, around this. Um, the commission just released um, the result of a lengthy uh, two-year discussion process around carbon farming, for example, that I'm sure 
will flow into some of the upcoming discussions. Um, we, we have a resource with the CAP. Uh, we have a discussion around how that could be organized. It's now up for policymakers to take the next step and create the legal governance framework to, to really drive those um, instruments. Perhaps to add on to, so, so I think it's also a bit, <clears throat> we have just as part of the budget, adopted a new uh, agriculture budget, as Andrea says, still the, the most significant part of the European budget. And this uh, financing, direct support, uh, first pillar, second pillar, more linked to substantive, um, um, let's say, practices, uh, also including greening um, of agriculture. Um, this has just been agreed end of last year. Um, when we talk about a new FOLU regime for the land use sectors, of course, this will enter into force, become effective probably in 2025 if negotiations start now. So in, in, at that point in time, we are coming to the end of the current budget cycle and the commission will then start preparing the new um, agricultural policy from the financing perspective. And then of course, it is critical to pick up on the different incentives um, for expanding things, for instance, that will be necessary to reach a climate neutral AFOLU uh, uh, regime by 2035. And so I do think that there is, as Andrea said, a direct uh, relationship already today, but um, in the future it will become much more important. So let's um, develop this AFOLU regime, be clear about the different roles of member states, of the different stakeholders in the sector, um, what are the responsibilities there, and then um, work this into the next CAP reform that I think is the politically um, most important challenge there. All right. So we have uh, yet another question regarding carbon pricing in building and transport. So a question from uh, Nicola Bergman. We know that carbon pricing in, in building, um, whoops, where did the question well? We know that carbon pricing in building and transport will, will be tricky to introduce because of its impact on vulnerable households. Would you favor EU guidelines on how revenues should be used by member states? For example, on how to avoid regressive impact of the new ETS you suggest? So, so. yes, um, so um, taxation is a competence of member states. And therefore, there, it, it is a bit tricky um, without the explicit permission of member states to fully regulate um, CO2 taxation or tax similar policies, um, as well as the use of the revenue. So um, to the extent that the current EU ETS already provides guidelines um, for the spending of, of EU uh, ETS revenues, we believe that this is a, a, a minimum, I think, um, requirement for a new separate ETS. It should be clear that the, uh, um, the revenues generated are used uh, for clean investments um, or compensation for the impacted households and businesses. And that can take different forms. Um, to what extent there are clear guidelines on what specific instruments are used to redistribute, for example, funds or support businesses. Um, there are different ways of looking at this. Some prefer um, you know, instruments such as a lump sum transfer. Some prefer to use uh, infrastructure funds um, to more specifically target clean investments uh, through infrastructure as, uh, investment support. Um, we believe uh, potentially every member state might know best how to use its fund funds within specific limits. Um, so each member state should be uh, like should likely be be uh, free to make use of it in the uh, also using existing instruments. So uh, Germany has uh, as an existing uh, energy and climate fund that is actually the core instrument for also, uh, for example, um, ta energy tax levy and surcharge reform today. Um, uh, using those revenues um, as Germany does uh, in the existing form, uh, 
might be the most straightforward way for them. Others, other member states will have other solutions. Um, Sweden, for example, gives its carbon pricing revenues back via via um, insurance uh, payment reductions um, as a lump sum transfers. There are different ways of doing this. Um, but again, yeah, so there should be a certain form of guidance and direction um, and conditionality, but um, there needs to be also mm -hmm. flexibility for member states to make the decisions that are best for them. So uh, we still have a few minutes left. Uh, a question from uh, Antonia Munz on uh, benchmark number eight. And uh, what would a phase out of new cleaner combust uh, combustion engines until 2035 look like? And is such a policy likely to be included in, a, in addition to the EU ETS? And she also So, yeah, I cannot so, hear you. Yeah, sorry, I'm just interrupting. Claire, we can't hear you anymore. Maybe I just finished the reading out the question, and then you can go ahead and we see mm. what the problem is, Claire. So, um, uh, Antonia Munz, first part you read out, and then also more generally, what about a coal electrification phase out on mm. EU level? Are we likely going to see such a policy? That's the question. Yeah, so let's start with the coal phase out electrification. Please. So according to the commission estimations, and this uh, is, we have exactly the same estimation, uh, the increase in the carbon prices expected under the strengthened emissions trading system means effectively we are uh, expecting a coal phase out almost completely across the European continent by 2030. So this is a direct effect of the increased carbon price. It's very important to be that clear because this needs to be prepared. It's only 10 years away and um, there are still a number of regions in Europe depending on coal generation and coal mining for a significant part of the regional um, population. And um, so this is of course uh, the transition needs to be planned, and we have seen in Germany, but also in other countries in Europe, that this is not an easy task. You need um, to prepare for this transition, and it will come fast. And so the Commission is helping. There is a specific uh, platform to engage um, between the regions and the Commission in a dialogue on how to transition out of uh, coal generation use across Europe. And there is a specific funding available, very uh, large quantities actually, over the next years to support such transitions, but inevitably it needs to be prepared in the regions. And this is um, cannot be emphasized enough. One of the preconditions, just to give an example, for uh, accessing the Just Transition Fund, the specific funding set up to support coal regions in transition, um, it does uh, presuppose that there is a climate neutrality commitment by uh, the country accessing those funds. And um, a clear planning by the regions using those funds to phase out of coal. So the planning needs to be done in order to get the financial support. But then it is available. Um, the combustion engine, I think there, it's a mix, no? Um, we are seeing a number of member states already putting in place end dates for the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, and I have the numbers better in your mind than I have. Uh, 2040, 2035, 2030, I believe in one case. And uh, so it will be a mix. Member states are pushing ahead with a clear regulatory um, limitations an end date to the sale of ICE vehicles and the EU um, standards on emissions from such ve vehicles effectively um, leading to the same transition that we, as Andrea said, believe must happen latest by 2035 because of the used vehicles still in the market. Yes, and, and I think um... So it's important to, to know that um, while there are these national 
um, commitments and targets to to phase out the combustion engine by 2040. There is a discussion on on whether it is legally permissible within the single market to do so. There are different views on this. Um, Clearly, the CO2 emissions performance standard would be a, 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 an instrument that could resolve this. It is already a EU regulation that uh, applies to, to uh, cars sold on the single market. Um, and um, in, in this sense, it could uh, resolve the issues for also the front runner countries in, in making this commitment. This being said, I think it's also very important to, to realize that um, uh, the earlier we transition to clean mobility, the earlier there will also be a single market for clean vehicles in second use. So what we currently have is a situation where uh, we have often very perverse policies like company, uh, company car support that is actually putting some of the worst performing cars on the market at, uh, um, in subsidized form. And then landing in other parts of Europe, other parts of the world um, to then become the burden for air pollution, become the burden for a future climate policy. Um, so I think it, it's also important uh, with the 2035 end date to think about this as this, let's say, the clear commitment to a used electric vehicle market. The commitment to supporting also poor, uh, poor households, poor member states to afford um, the electric vehicles of the future or at an earlier point in time and having less burden of dealing with the, the cars that might be flooding the market uh, that are no longer compatible with our climate commitment. So it, it goes beyond uh, simply um, single market regulation. It goes beyond... Um, it goes also. It's also about a, 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 an instrument for creating uh, the clean market we need um, in the future. Right. Can you hear me now? All okay. right. Excellent. <laughs> okay. So I believe uh, I believe this uh, Q and A session is over. Uh, right, Nicola, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yeah. You tell me if you if you want want to have one last question. Um, okay, we can. We're still fine. Um, Good. We'll squeeze that one in then. Because so, it fits so nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So a question from uh, Brick Medak. Uh, since the June package is quite broad, what should we focus on regarding a successful implementation of European Green Deal? What are the outstanding measures from your point of view? Oh, that's a very broad question. Yeah. <laughs> um, you want to talk about the clean energy package uh, implementation, and um, I can briefly talk about the governance regulation. Um, no, but in a way, I mean, the the challenge now is to rapidly accelerate across the board. This is why uh, the package again is very broad and even broader than the clean energy for all Europeans package. So. There are, are, of course, some measures where you could argue, yes, it's more important, but at the end of the day, we need them all because we need to accelerate across the board in all the sectors. And, of course, the ETS reform and uh, the development of a carbon pricing for transport and buildings as, I would say, a framework uh, condition for all economic activities in Europe is, in my view, a central um, factor in really accelerating because it sends a very important signal. Um, and then it comes down to where are the main barriers to accelerating the transition in the sectors. And there we do need, in addition to uh, the pricing signal, um, really sectoral legislation. Um, the governance regulation is important because uh, the planning challenge um, for the member states and at regional level uh, is a huge one. And all regions, all governments need to go through the questions in detail. How do we accelerate in the next few years? Very significantly so. Um, at the same time, as Andrea said, uh, there there is uh, an open um, obligation in some cases to implement 
the updated laws that were agreed at the end of 2018. So the Clean Energy for All Europeans package. And in that package, most importantly, if you're asking me to prioritize, I would say everything related to um, unlocking the potential of electricity markets to help us move through the transition, i.e. scaling more rapidly renewable electricity, um, creating demand side incentives to engage with the market signal, um, removing bottlenecks to permitting um, yeah, access to the market for the clean energy producers of the future. Um, but this is really centers on a full and effective and fast implementation of the electricity market regulation and the electricity market directive. This would be my implementation priority at the moment. Andreas, do you want to add? Yeah, I would just add that wherever there are new obligations that are coming with the package, I think we're at a point in the discussion where we know many of these instruments are coming. We know that they will have implementation challenges and we can't wait until yeah. the outcome of the negotiations to start working on them. When it, whether it comes, uh, whether it's MRV obligations for introducing the CBAM or whether it's introducing pilot projects for carbon pricing of emissions trading for the new emissions trading system, there are many technical questions that have to be um, worked on today we have the clarity with the July package of which direction things are going, and we cannot have the previous state um, of play where we often waited until the final ink dried to make very obvious next steps happen on the ground at very little administrative cost, but at major delay cost. Yeah. And so... Yeah. We have to be doing everything in parallel across all sectors, but we also have to be treating the package that will be uh, introduced as a potential outcome from day one. And perhaps to add to this, uh, Claire, and then I, then I stop. Um, so what will help us in the next years to accelerate is the new budget. And we have uh, decided because of the economic crisis uh, caused by COVID, to front load very, very significant amounts of EU funding um, that should help um, to fast track into the transition towards 2030. So most of the funding from this new financing framework actually is front loaded to 2021 to 2023, 24. It needs to be effectively spent by 2026. Now, it means that wherever and whoever you must use this opportunity to put the funding to the no regret transformative investments that we all know about. So accelerate building um, renovation through large scale initiatives um, quarter by quarter uh, in municipalities or cities to rapidly roll out the, the uh, electromobility infrastructure to help uh, coal regions move faster out of coal um, dependency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, we call this in our own work flagship transformative investments, and this is, I think, how it needs to be um, approached. It's clearly no no regret, and we know the no regrets that exist at this point. So let's not wait, as Andrea said, for the ink to be dried. Excellent. So with this, we now we are now at the end of our Q&A session. Thank you very much to all of you for your participation and uh, very sorry that we uh, couldn't uh, take up all the questions. Um, and with this, I am handing it to you, uh, Nicola, to you over, over to you. Yes. Thanks a lot, Claire, for taking care of the Q&A session. And also thank you for Andreas and Matthias for elaborating on the different incoming questions. For the ones whose questions were not answered, um, if they are burning under your nails, you can, of course, still address them to webinar at agora-energiewende.de, and we may be able to pick them from there. We'll take all the questions also into consideration um, and, and use it for the ongoing of this work. You may have recognized that the report itself has not been published on our website. 
We will do so in a few weeks and it's best to be kept up to date to register for our newsletter. And Maxi, maybe you could be so kind and post the registration link once more into the chat because with if you are a recipient of the newsletter, then you will always be informed when something new is on the website and also about any upcoming events. Regarding today's presentation, of course, you can still find it on the website. And once the recording is edited and on the website, we will also inform you via the newsletter. I think you can expect it by the end of the week. And let me check if I haven't forgotten anything. No, I think that's it. Thank you for staying with us. Sorry for nicking some uh, eight minutes of your lunch break. And um, see you next time and have a good day. We'll stay on the podium for a few more seconds in order not to kick you out of that meeting too abruptly. So um, just take your time and um, see you soon. Bye.